Good morning, everybody. Oh, hold on, Leandra's not muted. Good now? Okay, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Co-Plow Rounds. Uh, they will be presented today by Kelsey Brakel, Megan Clymans, and Leandra Tira. And uh, the first case, I am actually going to show you a slide before I show you the gross photo, so not to spoil anything. This is Mabel, who is a 12-year-old female state in Newfoundland. Um, and the first thing that we got was actually not a globe, and I, uh, which is why I don't have a gross photo of it. Um, but I will show you what it was. Uh, it was from the third eyelid. It was just a little snip biopsy, and they were concerned because the third eyelid seemed a little bit too thick. Um, and so this is what we got. And I'm mostly showing this to kind of show the difference between what we might get on a tiny little nubbin of something that the submitting veterinarian snips off versus what we can interpret from a larger sample. So um, we just got one piece of tissue. We bisected it. Um, it was so small that Histo had trouble sectioning it. And so we ended up with all of this fold artifact. Uh, but when you go closer, you can see that a lot of the cells um, have these really, really dark nuclei that are streaming out into kind of uh, streams, if you will. <laughs> um, so some of the nuclei are intact, um, but a lot of the nuclei have this sort of streaming quality. So this is all, all crush artifact. And this is what happens um, pretty much anytime you take a sample, you're gonna get crush around the edges. But when you have a really small sample, it's basically all edge. Um, and so if it's too small and too fragile, you get a lot of crush artifact. And then the only areas that you can really interpret are central areas like this. Um, and so we had a really difficult time interpreting this sample when we first got it. We could say that there were round cells in here. We could say that there were definitely some cells that were lymphocytes. Um, we had cells like, um, some of these guys in here that have more of this kind of almost foamy looking cytoplasm or possibly there's foamy matrix of some kind surrounding the cell. It's really difficult to say. Um, but that was all we really had to go on. Uh, the rest of the sample was just really condensed and crushed and it was really difficult to interpret. Um, and so we told the clinician, we're not sure what this is. Um, we think maybe there's some kind of lymphocytic and histiocytic component in here. It could be some kind of proliferative histiocytic disease. It could be inflammation. It could be neoplasia. We're not positive. And then we heard nothing for a while until they sent us the whole globe. So this is then what we got about three months later. Um, they told us that uh, the conjunctival thickening that they had reported before became progressive and unresponsive to topical pred and tacrolimus. Um, it got quickly worse, um, and then the owner decided that they wanted to remove the eye for comfort's sake. Uh, they also told us that since the biopsy, the dog had started to experience weight loss and the lymph nodes became prominent. Um, and so we looked at this and said, well, that's definitely not just a little bit of inflammation. Unfortunately. Um, so I will show you what the histo looks like of the actual globe. Right. So I guess I should actually, I can talk to you about the gross photo. I just showed it to you and was like, this is terrible. I didn't actually tell you what you were looking at. <laughs> it seemed intuitive to me. Okay, so here's the globe. The globe is actually relatively unaffected. Here's the cornea, here's the lens, uh, here's the iris, and then here's the posterior portion and the optic nerve is back here. And then this is all of the badness. So um, these are lids. We left the lids attached. Um, third eyelid is here. We left the third eyelid attached. And then all of the conge is expanded by this kind of soft white tissue, uh, which also expands the conjunctiva of the, of the third eyelid, as well as the bulbar conjunctiva. Um, and then it extends a little bit also into um, the eyelids themselves. So having said that, now we'll go to the histo. Now you understand, as perhaps you already did, that this is the problem. So um, I'm gonna put my mouse in the middle. So here's cornea here. There's lens going back to optic nerve. And like we saw grossly, everything inside of the globe is pretty normal. 
And then we go out to the conjunctiva. And these are those areas that we saw uh, grossly that were really thick and sort of soft white tissue. And as you can see, they're quite purple. Here's the third eyelid. You can see the cartilage of the third eyelid. So we know it's actually a uh, third eyelid and it's kind of hanging in there. Um, but a lot of the gland of the third eyelid has been effaced. There's some of it that's still present. Um, and again, everything is really, really expanded by all of this purple. So we're going to go look at the purple. Here we go, third eyelid. And let's just go closer and look at this right away. So from this magnification, you can see that there's sheets and sheets and sheets of cells. They don't have any kind of architecture except for the sort of pseudo architecture that's created by the collagen that was pre-existing and is mostly being destroyed. Um, and if we go closer, those cells are all round. Um, they have not a ton of cytoplasm, maybe a little bit more than you would expect from a normal lymphocyte, but less than you would expect from most other round cells. And um, they have oftentimes two nuclei. Um, there are some places where they have three. The nuclei are sometimes nice and round, and then sometimes they get really irregular and strange shaped. Um, and then they also have prominent nucleoli. There are some mitotic figures in here. You can see one here. Um, so uh, this was lymphoma, um, and uh, it was quite severe, and uh, we suspect that it probably is at this point systemic due to the fact that they described enlarged local lymph nodes as well as weight loss and sort of poor doing. Um, and so the it's not really a um, sort of dramatic and unusual case. Um, we see lymphoma in the conjunctiva not infrequently, um, but I think the reason that I wanted to show it is because I think um, a lot of times when clinicians send us really small samples, they're sometimes dismayed by the fact that we can't give them a good answer. And if I was the clinician and I had sent the little sample and then the eye had blown up like this and become a disaster, I would be like, how did you manage to miss lymphoma the first time around? Um, but I think it's it's useful to understand that sometimes with those really small samples, there's so much crush artifact that it can be really, really difficult to interpret. Um, and so sometimes we miss stuff. Um, and in that case, it's not so much that we missed it. We did tell them, you know, lymphoma is a possibility, but um, it, it wasn't something that we could definitively diagnose. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show sort of the contrast between what we got the first time and what we ended up with later. Um, so it's a quick one, but I thought it was interesting. Are there questions about this one? Okay. Another interesting point sometimes that happens very often is, um, that with lots of these kinds of tidal masses is that they grow and they tend to ulcerate. And if you take just a very superficial sample or biopsy, you end up with lots and lots of inflammation along with uh, a tumor like that. And that also complicates the diagnosis a lot. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think that clinicians are oftentimes trying to balance uh, sort of how invasive of a sample they want to collect versus how much they that we need to make a definitive diagnosis. And it's sometimes a really difficult balance to strike. Right, and uh, Ryan has a comment here that he said it's it important to mention that IHC is not helpful as much with those crush samples. Yes. So even if we end up with it, we could try to do some markers, but it would just, sometimes it adds more confusion than it's helpful and end up spending money and time. Yeah, when you crush, um, cells like that, a lot of times you distort the antigens that already exist. And so you get a lot of non-specific labeling. So if you do IHC on a sample like that, you can end up with everything labeling positive, even if it's not truly a T cell or truly a B cell, um, just because you smashed everything. All right. So we call it conjunctival large cell lymphoma. We saw areas with vascular invasion, but they were very infrequent. So I wasn't going to try and pick around and try and find them for you. Um, 
this case also had goniodysgenesis, um, but the globe was normal. And so we told them we weren't sure what the significance of that necessarily was for the other eye, given that glaucoma hadn't developed yet. Um, okay. The other case I'm going to show you is from a black-footed ferret. Uh, this was a really interesting case. Um, so black-footed ferrets are extremely endangered ferrets that are native to North America. Um, this came uh, from a conservation location, and um, it was one of eight of a litter that was born back in June. And of the litter of eight, four of the kits had unilateral microphthalmia, seven of the kits had corneal opacification, cataracts, and or persistent pupillary membranes. Um, and uh, this kit, um, had they described microphthalmia and corneal opacification that didn't allow them to see inside of the globe in this eye, which was the right eye. Um, and then they also described some periocular swelling and uh, they enucleated. Um, so this, I mostly want to show you because the gross photo, because the gross photo is really cool. Um, this didn't unfortunately come out as well in our histologic section, but it is really pretty. So cornea is up here, lens, the posterior aspect of the globe. So this dark band here is the iris. And then we have all of these little fine strands extending from the iris to the cornea. And these are those persistent pupillary membranes that they talked about being present in some of the other kits. They didn't describe them in this case, but I think it was because they did say the cornea was completely opaque. And so I think they might not have been able to appreciate them clinically. Um, and we couldn't tell that they were there when we hemisected the globe um, until we actually had it sectioned. And then we're like, oh, wow, look at all of these beautiful little guys. Um, so you don't always see these um, quite as pretty as this. Uh, so this was a, just a really cool case of persistent pupillary membrane. Um, and then I will show you what the histo looked like. All right, so they described macrophthalmia. We agree with them. It is a really small globe. Um, I don't have a good sense of how small a uh, black-footed ferret kit eye should be, um, but this did seem quite small. Um, so we've got cornea here. Here's our lens. Retina's back here. Looks really nice. We didn't get optic nerve in section, although we were starting to get close to it. Um, and here's the iris. And uh, you can see we don't have those beautiful strands um, that we we're able to see grossly. There is something here uh, that we'll go look at more closely. Um, and then there's kind of this very, very thin line that you can see here and here. And we're going to look at that more closely too, because that's a little bit unusual. But essentially, everything that's happening inside of this eye is happening in the anterior segment. There's Nothing really uh, going on with the retina, uh, optic nerve, nothing really happening with the lens. Um, so All right, so here's our iris. And you remember we saw that strange strand of stuff um, that was associated with the cornea on subgross. This slide is filthy. Let me hold on for a moment. Oh, that's a little better. Okay. Now you can believe that these things are true. So <laughs> um, here's the iris. We've got these tiny little cores of pigmented tissue that we'll go look at more closely. We've got this strand of uh, very, very thin tissue that we'll go look at more closely. And then We've got this here, same strand of tissue that's kind of coming off and then just curling. Um, and then you could imagine that maybe this was in some way attached to this, same sort of tinctorial property and then sort of blended in with the iris. Um, so let's go look at that more closely. That's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so We've got iris, which I think you can all pretty well agree on. And then we've got this tissue that looks basically exactly the same as iris. It's got um, sort of heavy pigmentation and then these small vessels inside of it, same way the iris does the heavy pigmentation with small vascular profiles. And then um, 
this here is extremely peculiar and uh, was a little bit difficult for us to describe, but essentially here we have Decimase membrane. It's really thin because this animal's really young and there's corneal endothelium overlying it on the inner aspect. Um, but then we also have this strand of material coming off that also looks like Decimase membrane. Um, and it's lined by corneal endothelium on both sides. And then we have this really heavily pigmented tissue um, that looks extremely similar to our iris and that strand of tissue that was coming off of the iris that we're calling persistent pupillary membrane. Um, so somehow we've got uh, at least part of Decimase membrane that's either reduplicated or detached or there's corneal endothelium just floating off into the anterior chamber. And then that has somehow adhered to this pupillary membrane. Um, and so we've got decimate membrane here. There's corneal endothelium here, and it's very difficult to make out decimase membrane at all um, associated with the cornea. So it, it's, it's hard to tell whether decimase membrane is present and extremely thin or if it's not there at all, and we just have corneal endothelium for some reason. As we go along, you can see that decimase membrane that's floating in the anterior chamber becomes duplicated, and we end up picking up at least some kind of basement membrane sort of adhered to the cornea. Um, it continues to be doubled and oh, bear with me. Um, and then we've got sort of a similar thing happening here where there's basement membrane that's decimase membrane it's here. Um, but then we also have more strands of it uh, sort of detached from the cornea, um, which may or may not be associated with those persistent pupillary membranes. We know that we have another one of those membranes here. Mm -hmm. And you can just kind of imagine that uh, if we had this perfectly in section, it would have been a continuous strand of pigmented tissue going all the way from the iris up to decimase membrane um, up here. And then down here, you can see kind of how it's associated with the original decimase membrane that's attached to the cornea itself. So here's decimase and then it becomes extremely thick and part of it branches off into space and the other part remains attached to the cornea. I think that's the perfect shot right there to answer that question about and probably in the field of migrating yeah. and using the scaffold or the pupillary membranes to form these intracamera vessels and brain aggregates like that. That's super easy. They're really pretty. Um, they're, they're on a journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a journey to the iris. Um, yeah, and like I said, there wasn't really anything else going on with um, the rest of the globe. The rest of the globe was really normal. We just had uh, these strange things happening in the anterior chamber. So can we move the anterior lens? Sure. Uh, we can. Right. Um, OK. You wanted to look at the anterior lens. Um, so we've got lens epithelium. Um, I don't know if we got a really great cut because it looks almost like we kind of have lens bow almost. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know that that is necessarily real. I think it's possible that that's artifact of how we cut it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. I wouldn't get too excited about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish it was more exciting for you. I'll do this. I think it's yeah. probably a, an equatorial type section. Yeah. A little tendential where like it's always coming towards us. Yeah. 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 And Dr. D made a good point here saying that the major complaint was corneal opacity. So mm -hmm. the fact that you always saw changes in the corneal kind of makes sense in this case. Right. And also, just to point it out, like, great job of taking a close image of this. this these membranes, are, as you would imagine, our heart section on a, you know, from a 3D to a 2D slide perspective. So you, if you only have the slide and you see those tiny islands of tissue that Kelsey was showing, it kind of don't look like much, but once you have an idea of the history of what it looks grossly, it makes much more sense. And it's way prettier than just that. <laughs> and Dr. Trudy was asking, was there a corner of humor? Um, they didn't describe it clinically. We can look and you can tell me if there's corneal edema. 
I am scared to diagnose corneal edema histologically. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, we can look at the gross photo again too if you want, but uh, I don't know. It's could be, but hard to tell. It's hard for me to say. I don't know. The building of that sniffing brain and all those membranes in the background could potentially have caused some of the opacity. Uh, the yeah. by opacity um, could be related to that. It doesn't really look like straight up. Uh, histologically identifiable corneal from edema, yeah. but we all, we know that there's a definitely hard correlation between clinical and histologic corneal edema. So it could have been the difference, even right. if they didn't say that. And I would imagine that if you had decimated membrane, like not only doubled but also like separated yeah. from the cornea, that you would have a difference in refraction and stuff. Yeah. So, so doctor, you also suggest. Potentially an endothelial dystrophy mm. along with uh, with the migration. I think that's an excellent idea and mm -hmm. an excellent possibility. So you have both the pupillary membranes and endothelial dystrophy of some sort. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Adding to the black fruit parrot literature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're really endangered. So I would imagine that the captive population is probably fairly inbred, mm. although I don't know that for sure. Um, yeah, so we um diagnose the microphthalmia that they described clinically. We kind of made a descriptive diagnosis with Desmase membrane doubling mm -hmm. and uh, axial absence. We had that area where it was difficult to make out and then the persistent pupillary membranes. We talked about the possibility of this being some kind of anterior cleavage syndrome or Peters anomaly um, or just some kind of anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, fundamentally, the anterior segment did not form appropriately, um, and it's kind of hard to say at this point what exactly happened here, but um, it's clearly a congenital lesion that um, was anterior segment focused. Um, okay, and that is the end of my cases. Where's my insight? Lots of interesting comments here. So, someone that someone listed as iPad. So, iPad said <laughs> during Brad, the population from Congress population of about 18 ferrets in 1980. Oh, an additional history here of uh, that of all this E. coli culture on these home pathogen in those colonies, and that's the third comments. And the holder is here saying if this is the right case. I don't think we've got any other like food and ferrets. I don't think so. so uh, you can see on the side there. So probably that's the one in the back. So we have, yeah, for the it's only a conservation biology institute. So. Cool. All right. Um, so our next case is Macy. Uh, Macy is a six-year-old state female visla. Um, we have the left lobe. Uh, so they describe a traumatic uveitis, history of bird shot to face slash body on uh, um, late November. Uh, the shot was identified in the orbit on radiographs. Um, so they did find with ultrasound uh, some retinal attachment, and they found what they thought was an exit hole in the posterior globe. Um, they also note some pretty significant dorsal conjunctival bruising and swelling, um, and the eye was full of hemorrhage. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not uh, big into hunting like myself, um, bird shots, uh, as I understand it, is basically um, a type of shot that has multiple little teeny, teeny little pellets, pellets or BBs. Um, and when you shoot it, it sort of is designed to spread out with all of these little, little tiny pellets. So um, what probably hit the eye was a little kind of small round metal BB. Um, and this is a beautiful picture um, by Kelsey, uh, which captures the exit wound quite nicely. So um, in the hemi section here, we have the cornea here, of course. Uh, we have the globe full of hemorrhage, particularly notable in the vitreous right now. And here is our little defect right here in the posterior sclera. Um, 
dorsal posterior sclera. And then we also have the whole globe. So here's the optic nerve here. And here are the posterior ciliary arteries. And usually the optic nerve is a little bit ventral to the posterior ciliary arteries. So we're looking at the dorsal globe, this half of the globe here. And so uh, here again is that dorsal posterior scleral defect with the globe intact and photographed on the back. Um, so really nice uh, picture to show off what's going on. And we will take a look at the histology. There. All right, so here's a subgross view of this globe, and here is our defect right here. Um, Kelsey again did an excellent section capturing this defect right in the middle, and so here it is right there. You can see its full thickness. You can see the hemorrhage and the fibrin sort of tracking from that defect. Um, the, uh, oh, I was just going to say that the surgery was done on the 28th, so that's about a three-day duration between when this dog uh, was shot and when the eye was removed. Um, so it's a fairly acute, um, a subacute history. Not a lot of time for this hemorrhage to sort of organize or anything like that, pretty much just hemorrhage in the globe. Um, the rest of the globe is pretty quiet, except for what's going on around this exit hole. Um, and the other main thing to note on the subgross here is um, we can see the ciliary body here. Here's the pars plica coming into pars plana. Here's the aura ciliaris retinae. And then this is choroid through here. It's just kind of thin. So beneath the choroid, between the choroid and the sclera, there's this potential space. Uh, under normal conditions, this should not be a space that has anything in it. Um, in this case, that space is now full of hemorrhage. Um, so what this is, is a superchoroidal hemorrhage. Um, we typically call these expulsive superchoroidal hemorrhage um, because they can happen um, with corneal perforation or in this case, the posterior scleral perforation. And then you get this sudden loss of pressure in the globe, um, like a sudden decompression. Um, and that uh, creates this potential space that now then becomes a actual space and fills up sometimes with edema, sometimes with hemorrhage. Um, so just a feature of kind of sudden loss of pressure in the globe in this case because of the um, shot induced hole. The other interesting trauma induced feature in this globe will come in the back. Ignore the little dots. <laughs> Um, so you can see the hole here a little bit closer. You can see that there's a little bit of this pigmented tissue wrapping around the outside of the globe, um, kind of suggesting that some of the inner contents of the globe have been carried out. And then the other interesting feature of trauma that I want to show you, ah, there's also this. Um, before I move on from here, though, uh, there's this fiber here, which is very fun. Um, so this is likely a, a hair shaft. Um, so we had bits of hair and things like that that got trapped in the eye as the bird shot passed through. Um, but the feature that I keep winding up to show you, which now I will actually show you. So if you check the retina here, all the layers are in place. We still have nice ganglion cells. Um, but what we have down here, the photoreceptor segments, these should look like nice little crisp circles, like these very regular lines. They're a little fragmented now and a little bit sad looking. And we see all these little spells lined up along them. And those are little macrophages that are starting right. to size. Yeah, let's go ahead. Good suggestion. Here you go. Um, little macrophages. Here, 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 everywhere, kind of sagitizing those photos of their segments. And if you actually look at the, the layers, while they're, they're all present, many of the cells in the photoreceptor layers, for example, aren't looking particularly healthy. Um, you can check out this nucleus, for example, which looks a little bit larger, and a little bit more healthy. A lot of the nuclei around can be very small and technotic. Um, so this is acute necrosis in this retina. Um, and what most likely happens in these cases of trauma um, is that this is a um, shock wave, in essence, that spreads out from the point of injury 
um, and kind of disturbs all the cells. We're talking about like cells and tissues kind of bumping into one another as the shock wave spreads. Um, you can imagine it kind of almost like a whiplash effect too. Um, and this can induce this acute retinal necrosis that we're seeing here, um, particularly evident in the photoreceptor segment in the outer uh, nuclear layer. Um, so this is an interesting feature that can occur in cases of blunt trauma, um, or in this case, the, the gunshot that was passing through the eye. Um, so those are all of the key histologic features that I wanted to show you in this case. Um, it's also interesting with okay. trauma, since we're talking about trauma and data, uh, a lot of the feedback or uh, energy wave, sort of like bomb-related injuries that happen with Soldiers, for example, kind of wow. correlate to things like that, where you have that first blast. Uh, individuals survive, they might have concussions and or you know, concussive lesions in the brain. But one of the known things that happen is that they start going blind 24, two days after the blast. And that's because of that delayed effect on the photoreceptors and in the retina. So, think of all those ballistic regions as those like a penetrating, but it's also like an energy blunt wave kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So there's some diagnoses. Um, we never found the entrance wounds. Uh, we presume that the one that we were just looking at was exits. Usually the entrance wound for a gunshot is much smaller than the exit wound. Um, there was a lot of dorsal conjunctival swelling and hemorrhage, so you might be able to speculate that the path of the bullet was sort of like incidental across the dorsal globe, kind of in from the front and out through that posterior dorsal square in the back. But we never found the exit wound, so or entrance wound, sorry, so that's all speculative. Um, but in any case, that is uh, this case. Or comments or anything like that. Okay, we'll move on. This is a really cool case. They're all really cool cases. Here we go. Uh, so our next page is cash. Four-year-old neutered male rough cotton. Um, so Cash, I will withhold actually, I think, some of the clinical history for Cash. Um, because I think it sort of um gives too many hints as to what we're about to look at. Um, so hang tight on that, I will share that in hot seconds. Um, but we did get both eyes on cash. Um, so uh here is our left, here is our right. And the gross findings, and I will reveal the histologic findings as well, were very, very similar between these two clones. Um, so uh, in both cases, we have this thickened and kind of heterogeneous looking uh, iris and ciliary body, this sort of like brownish, softened looking anterior media. Um, and uh, there's lots of hemorrhage in the eye. And those are the main gross things that I draw your attention to. Um, I'll also note that this dog's eyes, uh, irises were described as both blue and brown. Um, and we weren't sure if that meant that there was one blue and one brown eye, or if this was heterochromic iridus within each or either eye, uh, where you can have basically segmental blue versus brown iris in the same eye. Um, either is possible. Um, it's hard to tell what the iris color is at this point because the anterior media is quite distorted. Um, so that is all we'll say about the gross. We'll switch to histo. Not the right button to push. There we go. Oh, oh. Hmm? oh, oh. that's right. I didn't do that. No, you was already last. Oh, oh. Uh, we're going to start with this one. Even though the cornea is incomplete, we'll do this globe because it has a cooler up. Um, so here's a subgrowth of this eye. Um, there is a little artifactual absence of the cornea. Pay no mind to that, despite the fact that I just pointed it out. Uh, this eye is cooler to show for a further reason. Um, the anterior uvea is very thickened and it is definitely hypercellular. 
cellular, there is a chaos of cells in there. You can see the little bits of hemorrhage coming in uh, here in the histo. Um, the back of the eye, by comparison, is very quiescent. We're not seeing a whole lot of that same chaos in the anterior uvea. Um, and then we do have something kind of funky looking going on in the optic nerve, which we'll look at closely in a second. So looking closer at what is going on in this anterior uvea, I'm gonna start up here. This is a mixed population of cells, and it is in fact inflammatory. And the quality is actually this one field represents a lot of these cells pretty well. Um, and the characteristics of this inflammation is that it's predominantly um, macrophage based. So a lot of these big cells here are macrophages, and a large number of those macrophages are laden with melanin, heavily laden with melanin. They've been gobbling that pigment up. Um, also in this field, in this corner here, we have just overt necrosis in the uvea. Um, the tissue is basically replaced by necrotic debris. And then uh, scattered here and there, we have neutrophils, of course, because of the necrosis. And there's going to be a couple of lymphocytes and plasma cells as well. Here's some examples of those down here. Um, so predominantly, we have a histiocytic uh, anterior uveitis with a lot of melanin-like macrophages. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. You can see in particular along the back of the iris, usually there should be that layer of pigmented iris epithelium. It's basically gone. Nothing there. And here in the ciliary body, as we get into the clica, that pigmented epithelium is also sort of multifocally, so to say, mentally. And similar, really severe inflammation in the ciliary body and even extended kind of sclera. And then as we walk our way back, that inflammation peters out. But there's something else that peters out. So we go one in as we walk further along. So we still have something of a choroid through here. There's some sort of tissue here. There's a little bit of lymphoplasmocytic infiltration there. And as we keep going, what we have here, from here to here, is mostly just retina now. It's really atrophy, so it's sort of hard to make out. But here where it's done this artifactual separation, it's easier to see. And so we have retina from here to here that's very severely atrophied, full thickness atrophy. And then there's not really much of a choroid beneath it. Let's go closer to show you that. So you can make out this layer of cells that's uh, pretty consistent with uh, retinal pigment epithelium, but there's barely any stroma beneath that before you hit scleral colony. Um, so what we're looking at here is a very hypoplastic colloid. It's barely there at all. Um, and it's not very inflamed, but it's very hypoplastic. Coming in, we have a little bit more of a retina dorsally here. And then comparing that dorsal or tapetal side to the ventral side here, atypical side. The retinal pigment epithelium on this side is totally gone. Again, we don't have much of a choroid here. This all mostly looks like retina. Um, and the retina is pretty severely atrophied. Um, so it's kind of worse on the ventral side. Um, you can have loss of the RPE just from glaucoma-induced retinal atrophy. Um, but it's just interesting that, relatively speaking, um, the pigmented RPE is what is the, the RPE that actually has pigment in the cytoplasm on the HPO side is the one that's very much absent. Going into this optic nerve, um, we have very deep cupping atrophy, um, and this is most likely glaucoma induced. But you can see the edges of where the optic disc would probably normally be from here to here. And there's more things going on next to that optic disc. So the lambda cribosa doesn't really extend across the entire length of this neuroparenchyma-like tissue here. You can kind of see the beams of lambda cribosa over here, and then it just sort of ends. And we have this disorganized neuroparenchyma kind of bulging into the posterior globe here. Um, so this is a coloboma. 
Um, most likely uh, incomplete closure of the optic fissure back here is a common way for colobomas to happen. Um, and the other cool feature of this likely congenital lesion here, we have these little clusters next to the optic nerve in the peripatular connective tissue um, that are this primitive kind of neuroparenchymal mold of the tissue. We'll look closer at that. And they're just sort of multifocally hanging out here. Um, so, all said and told, this dog has um, Collie Eye Anomaly. Um, Collie Eye Anomaly is uh, a series of different types of phenotypic expressions. It doesn't always present exactly the same way in every case. It can be incidental, it can lead to clinical blindness. Um, there's a lot of variability in how it presents. In this case, um, we attribute the choroidal hypoplasia likely to call the eye anomaly and then definitely uh, the coloboma um, back here to call the eye anomaly. Um, the other eye clinically had a coloboma. The histology of that optic nerve was not as good, so I showed you the better one. Um, there was also glaucoma in this eye um, due to the distortion of the anterior uvea, which was very severe. And um, with respect to that inflammation, which I'll remind you was uh, histiocytic, lymphoplasmacytic, necrotizing, and it was very rich in melanin-laden macrophages in particular. Um, I'll now add the clinical history that I withheld. Um, this dog developed a bilateral anterior uveitis. This dog also had um, facial vitiligo and teleosis, which means that the hair was losing its pigmentation. Um, and that is mostly what I have for you. And the bilateral symmetrical. Yes, bilaterally symmetrical presentation, yeah. Um, so if you guys, you guys probably already have a diagnosis in mind after all of that. Um, and indeed, uh, this was diagnosed as VKH like disease in dogs or uveo dermatologic syndrome. Um, VKH stands for Voigt Koyanagi Harada, which is a specific disease in humans. Um, it's potentially a little bit different in dogs than it is in humans to have a similar presentation, but dogs don't typically have the um, otic. Uh, inflammation or meningitis that people have. Um, it's probably a different mutation. It is at least thought to be a uh, immune or autoimmune condition um, targeting melanin, um, uh, leading to in dogs usually the, the um, mugitis, which is usually bilateral and symmetrical. Sometimes you can have one eye go first and the other eye go shortly after, but oftentimes it's a bilaterally symmetrical presentation. Um, and we uh, usually periocular or facial um, cutaneous disease. Um, especially presenting as alopecia potentially, and then loss of pigmentation in that uh, hair. Um, you can uh, see uveitis, I think, more typically presenting before the skin signs present, but um, not always. Uh, so uh, that was this case. And the really cool feature of this case, too, is because of the collie eye anomaly and the hypoplastic choroid, we had this pattern where it was much more severe in, in inflammation in the uvea. Uh, in the anterior uvea with apparent relative sparing of the choroid, but it's mostly because there wasn't much choroid there to begin with, um, including not much pigmented cells to kind of um, attack in that choroid, um, which is interesting because the more typical histologic presentation of VKH-like disease in dogs is that it is very severe in the choroid, um, but uh, not in this case. So um, this is a cool combination of overlapping um, regions in this case. Uh, so, and here's the diagnoses for this one, uh, and that's it for me. Then I have a chat. Yes. Okay, next case is my Leandro here. This. Oh, yeah. Speaking of unusual cases, this probably takes the trophy. This is an. Um, 
14-year-old female llama named Beyond Your Dreams, if you're dating a dreamer, this is poetic confusion. We have the nicest drawings here, unfortunately, can show you guys, but, um, and the history is very convoluted. Uh, it intersects and interacts nicely with the drawings, which makes it hard to read as a story, but I love the drawings, so I kind of like them. Basically, they described um, multiple white, rigid, presumably ossified regions associated with the cornea and protruding into the interior chamber, uh, along with fibrin and uh, somewhat touching the endothelium. Um, they were concerned for a potential neoplasia, but everything else was largely unremarkable. Uh, and I think that's about it. So this is beyond your dreams. We have two uh, views of this image. First one, as you can see, the frontal image, there's diffuse coronal opacification. And what they're mostly describing is this white lesion uh, next to the limbus, infiltrating the cornea. So it's very you know, densely white, and uh, apparently on palpation was hard, and they were suspecting bone or a mineralized lesion. On a uh, cut section, it became less obvious, but if you use your imaginoscope here, here we got the cornea. You can see that same opaque lesion, uh, which it's interesting to see. With uh, it's not necessarily like a large mass occupying the interior chamber; it's more like a lesion that is infiltrating, molding to the corneal stroma. It goes around and you can see it does carpet the iris surface right so it goes all the way down there and there's a similar change on the other you the carnal angle slash anterior iris surface histologically this is what we end up with way larger eye than the previous one so let's uh Take some time to find our bearings here. So, your chamber, right? We have our iris leaflets, the beautiful corporate nigra. I should know this, but I think llamas, so the corporate nigra is kind of a shading structure, it's a um, You can think of it as like a, you know, a visor that shades some of that light that comes in. Llamas and some other candidates, they have, so horses, they usually have a corporate nigra on the dorsal aspect, right, because a lot of the light comes from the surface. So llamas and other candidates, they have corporate nigras that are both on the dorsal and the ventral aspect of the eye. Anybody knows or can surmise why they have corporate nigra in both the dorsal and ventral? Exactly so, because they're usually in the Andes, in the snow. There's also snow in Wisconsin, but they're not uh, native from these parts of the world. So a lot of the light would kind of hit the snow and reflect back. That's why it's a neat adaptation where they have corpora, nigra, AI, I don't know how well it's the plural of corpora, nigra. We just call it Yeah, pupillary rule. Much better in both the dorsal and ventral aspect. So uh, this is the dorsal, but this, there's a little bit here. It's not nicely sampled. But I, you know, as Evan, you would say, I digest. And I'll go back to the main lesion here. These are the lesions we were seeing grossly. So um, two hyperusinophilic structures that are connected to the cornea, bulging into the interior chamber and carpeting the iris on this side. And similarly, uh, doing the same thing, kind of molding to the original architecture on the other side. Right away, if you're used to seeing things, you realize that this really looks like bone, right? The rest of the, the eyes, relatively normal. There's not much to describe there. So let's focus on the stuff in the interior chamber. 
Okay, so right away we realize that there's an add structure there that you wouldn't necessarily expect. First thing before we get to that, here's the SMS membrane. There's an obvious break right there, right? And then it continues more peripherally. We have a fibrous tissue that extends into the interior chamber and uh, contacts that bone-like structure. And let's get that out of the way. Keep seeing bone-like structure because that is actually bone, right? This is beautiful lamellar bone. Even you can see, you know, osteocytes spread throughout. You can see the lamellar collagen around, almost forming like an osteon, and a little chunk of femur in the eye. Did we? Um, yeah, so we decal this eye before we send it in. Uh, so we decalcify it so that we can get a section of it, but you can still see some mineralized areas throughout. Um, other features of it, it has a an attempted medullary cavity formation there. Uh, there's some beautiful osteoblasts lining the medullary cavity. I mean, if you, if you just show that, image right there to anyone. If anyone said, oh, that looked like an eye, they'll be lying. There's no way you can tell. So osteoblasts, osteocytes, so very well formed and mature bone. You can even see the lamellae. Uh, so lamellar bone, well-organized bone, osteocytes everywhere. So this is pretty. Um, if you have never seen a lama eye, uh, question might have been, do lamas have bone in their eyes? Because this looks so anatomical. And the answer is no. Um, other hints that we see here is this fibrous tissue coming around. And if you look around, there's some osteoid material spread in here. So you got these fibroblastic or elongated cells, probably osteoblasts, and they're producing osteoid along with this fibrous connective tissue matrix, maybe some more osteoid and, and bone forming there. Um, when we go back to the cornea itself, as I mentioned, here is decimal membrane. Um, you know, as opposed to that ferret where we couldn't see decimal membrane, this is pretty obvious. Oh, with a 14 year old lemma. So the older the animal gets, the thicker decimal membrane gets also. So, relative to the older animal, there's a definite break in the peripheral decimal membrane. There's some hemorrhage associated to it. The, Fragment of decimal membrane picks up again over there. You can see again more hemorrhage, some hemosiderin laden macrophages suggesting an active, more chronic um, hemorrhagic process. And then we walk our way back into the irritocornal angle. There's a, an additional break in decimal membrane right here. And then we are into the uh, irritocornal angle with the primary and secondary pectinal ligaments. Cool. We know what those things are. We just don't know what they're doing there and why they're there. We'll try to get to that soon. So the other end, same thing, a, a break in decimal membrane. And you can see um, if you Photoshop that back in place, probably was going underneath and closer to that other fragment. And same story, uh, another break in decimal membrane, which is replaced by this fibrous connective tissue. And then very neat, very well organized bone formation in that area. Along with some fibroblasts, beautiful looking osteoid being produced around. And you can see how nicely it molds itself to the original anatomy. It kind of carpets the, the iris there, molds itself into the irritocornal angle region, right? Uh, you should have seen here some hints of trabecula meshwork, the ciliary clasp, but oh, it's just bone and goes kind of deep into the trabecular meshwork and the ciliary clasp. There's more of that fibrosis and osteoid, that matrix around it. So um, since we know llamas shouldn't have bone in their eyes, uh, this is, in a nutshell, a heterotopic bone formation. There's some bone that shouldn't be there. Why is it there, right? Is this, oh, we have an extra section. Let me just show because this um, is the same thing. It's just a, 
maybe a better or more new version of it. We cut additional sections up another angle, another irritable corner angle, I should say, and it kind of got the same stuff, maybe a little bit more robust bone formation, you know, and a little bit more of that ruptured, irregular kind of, you know, wrinkled decimus membrane here and there. You can see another piece of it and extensive fibrosis of the exposed stroma fragmentation of the membrane. So the question is, what is it doing there? Um, we don't necessarily know. The two options are that something congenital, the animal was born with that, or it's something related, or it's something reactive. If reactive, likely related to trauma, which we do have some suggestions here based on that uh, multifocal, typically extensive breaks in the SMS membrane, we don't get that. Very often, some might say, "Oh, couldn't that be just a defect in the membrane versus a break in the membrane?" Um, I think the answer is yes. The one thing I have against it is just the fragmented nature of it, and how um, you don't see in smaller decimal membrane. I don't know if you guys remember. I just mentioned the decimal membrane gets thicker with time, so sometimes when you have trauma early in the you know, the animal slide, you end up with a thinner original decimal membrane with an additional thicker one that grows after. So there's nothing here that suggests an original smaller decimal membrane. Maybe here there's some doubling, but it there, yeah, just because I said that, <laughs> that's a small one over there. But in general, the larger fragments appear to be just a neat straight up break in there. Uh, so, I think, in my mind, I uh, favored a traumatic event, leading to some chronic reaction activation of some uh, mesenchymal stem cell like precursor in there somewhere. And these cells decided, you know what would be cool to have here? Some bone. So they proliferated and they're like, let's produce some osteoid matrix and see what happens after five, six nine, 10 years. So what happens is you end up with a beautiful looking bone in the eye. More trials getting into that eye. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, that definitely solves it. Uh, very uh, well stabilized. Right, well stabilized, you know. And uh, and this is what we got. So what are we doing in terms of time? So what did we call this? I think I gave it yeah, very non-specific, focal extensive to multifocal peripheral decimals and very rupture and fragmentation, fibrosis and extensive intracameral and irritocoronal heterotoxic bone formation, idiopathic. Meaning, uh, I don't know. On the comments, I just wrote exactly what I just told you guys that I gave a traumatic event, but this is not something we've seen before. Okay, I have two minutes and I will run through the next one. Uh, this is uh, Abel, the 12 year old Newfie, New Fallen Dog. Uh, I want a small flat. Yep. <laughs> Mabel. Yeah. Okay, so this is not Mabel. Of course. Here's the number. This is Sassy. Sassy is a five year old boxer. And um, recent findings chronic glaucoma, chronic hyphema mediatis, mass degrading through the dorsal sclera. Um, on April, Sassy had a lobectomy from a pulmonary tumor, which we're going to hold on to the information here. Uh, and that's all the information I'm going to give you guys. Um, here is the mass that they describe extending and infiltrating the limbus, equatorial or the, the limbal sclera, the iris and ciliary body. There's rapid attachment and hemorrhage everywhere. And here is the slide. Be quick. A little bit of a um, distorted globe in a way. It was a large globe, so 
the section so it fit in a cassette. Um, there was some conversation about, you know, online about this technique of like rolling things in. I am uh, not a big fan, but sometimes, you know, just gotta get done with the day. And this was a mask and kind of an obvious case, so so we're confident doing it. So let's go right into the thick of things. Uh, right away at this magnification, you can start seeing that there are cells and there are cells. Right, these guys are enormous. You can see them right away from 4x. Getting closer, they're still enormous. And when we got a little, here we got 3x. Brown cells, sheets of brown cells, very pleomorphic cells with multiple nucleoli, relatively large amount of cytoplasm, sometimes a little bit. Uh, uh, um, now I was going to say vaccinated, but not so much. My thought figures everywhere. And these cells, there's multinucleated giant neoplastic cells. Few of them have one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine nuclei, round to you know, elongated uh, some malignant neoplasm with features like that, especially the large, the pleomorphism, the large numbers of multinucleated giant cells is consistent with the histocytic sarcoma. And that's the history. It had a lobectomy due to a pulmonary histocytic sarcoma already. So we know the dog already has systemic disease. Uh, based on our experience, when uh, dogs are diagnosed with histocytic sarcoma in the eye, echo plow, there are uh, Average survival time is about three months. And, uh, you know, the disease is already, usually already uh, systemically spread, and this was the case. So, the acidic sarcoma, unfortunately, diagnosis for assessing. And that's what we have for you guys. Thanks for hanging out for the extra two minutes. Um, and uh, have a good rest of your week. <laughs> <laughs> was the 